I'm Janice Fimango from the University of Ottawa, and my theme today is privilege. This is the third in my five-part series on feminist terms from academia that have been successfully mainstreamed to shore up feminist arguments in the public sphere. The two terms I've addressed so far are gender as a social construct, which has been effectively used to argue that because there are no natural differences between the sexes, any differentiation in men's and women's roles and achievements is due to patriarchal oppression of women. The idea of gender as a social construct also justifies massive, really unlimited, social engineering to change male and female roles. Without the concept of gender as a social construct, much of feminism, as we know it today, would cease to exist. The second term was lived experience, a term almost exclusively applied to women's experiences and beliefs, with the foundational assumption being that because women have always been outside of structures of power, female insights into the operation of our society are more valuable than men's and should be at the center of research and discussion. The term is often used to preempt criticism and to suggest that no decent person would ever doubt women's experience and perceptions, and to invalidate men's experience and perceptions, especially in such matters as claims of sexual assault and harassment. If she believes it happened, it happened, so the theory goes. Incredibly damaging for men and boys in our society, it seems to me that these are the two most important terms in feminist theory. One says that everything feminists don't like is because of male power, and the other says that everything women believe, think, experience, and desire is by definition true and must be taken seriously. The next three terms are, in a sense, elaborations on these two. The terms are Privilege, a term used to shame men to make their achievements in the world invalid and to suggest that they should give them up. Structural violence, a term used to make it seem true that even women who have led extraordinarily safe, prosperous, and free lives are in some sense victims of violence, a brilliant rhetorical move and microaggression to make the case that even when actual incidents of violence become rare and sporadic, claims of victimhood by women and other groups can continue unimpeded. What is so important about all of these terms, I will argue, is that they extend the discussion of discrimination far beyond the domain of rational argument into the nebulous realm of emotion-based belief where sane people must but fear to tread. So, privilege. This is a word that, once neutral or even positive, as in it's a privilege to meet you, has been given a negative connotation by feminists with the suggestion that there's something morally shameful in accidents of birth. This concept of privilege was originally applied mainly to what Michael Walsh has jestingly called the unbearable whiteness of being. Though the term white skin privilege had been used throughout the 20th century, it was given prominent academic currency in an article published in 1988 by Wellesley College Women's Studies professor Peggy McIntosh, and it quickly became the Bible of every devout SJW of the time. McIntosh's point was that racism is not just individual acts of discrimination based on race, it is a whole system, advantaging whites and disadvantaging non-whites, much of it invisible and therefore difficult to change or even to see clearly. So McIntosh made a preliminary numbered list of such white privileges. It's a series of sweeping generalizations, many of them difficult to prove or disprove, and that make no distinction between actual racial discrimination and simple numerical fact, as in the following example. Quote, I can go into a bookshop and count on finding the writing of my race represented, or into a supermarket and find the staple foods that fit with my cultural traditions or into a hairdresser's shop and find someone who can deal with my hair. 
True, in most majority white towns, though having nothing to do with privilege or exclusion, and certainly not true in towns where non-whites make up significant minorities, having everything to do with history, demographics, and supply and demand. Many of McIntosh's assertions are actually highly dubious, as in this example, quote, I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. Not true then or now. In fact, McIntosh was speaking for all people of her racial group. Here's another, quote, I can be pretty sure that an argument with a colleague of another race is more likely to jeopardize her chances for advancement than to jeopardize mine. Definitely not true then or now in the politically correct world out of which Macintosh was writing, as any perusal of newspaper reports about racially charged incidents on university campuses will reveal. Anyway, in addition to signaling her virtue in being able to see what most whites couldn't or wouldn't see, Macintosh had an ulterior motive with the list she compiled. She used it to suggest that the work she had done to understand her invisible privilege as a middle-class white woman was work that men should do to understand how maleness similarly advantaged them in multiple, often deeply subtle and difficult to recognize ways. And feminists soon began compiling such lists of male privilege, now widely available on the internet and granted the status of holy writ. A correspondent friend from Australia recently told me that he and his colleagues, who do astronomical research, were asked at the opening session of the annual conference of the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research to study and discuss one such male privilege checklist as a kind of consciousness-raising exercise to combat sexism in astronomy. They had to pair up with a colleague to discuss the list and then when called on, publicly confess their privilege, if they were male, or uh, to itemize their victimization if they were female. The similarity to communist sessions in public self-criticism designed to force unity of thought and to discourage backsliding is stunning. Much of the male privilege checklist would be laugh out loud funny if it were intended as satire because it's a series of often completely false assertions, such as, quote, my odds of being hired for a job when competing against female applicants are probably skewed in my favor. The more prestigious the job, the larger the odds are skewed, end quote. Not, end quote, As a child, chances are I got more teacher attention than girls who raised their hands just as often, end quote. Emphatically not. Even if these assertions had some validity, which they do not, the idea of a bunch of PhDs in astronomy having to publicly confess their sinful privilege at the opening session of a radio astronomy research conference is shockingly indicative of ideological totalitarianism. In time, the idea of privilege spread to many other areas of human experience as well, including social class, sexual identity, body size, disability, and on and on and ritualized confessions of privilege became a primary SJW oath and mark of membership. I am a white heterosexual male, so I personally feel that I enjoy a lot of the privilege that a lot of people in this room, in this country, in this world do not. I on a conscious and subconscious level that I have benefited from being a white male. I'm white, I'm male, I'm straight, <laughs> um, I'm temporarily able-bodied, and I'm socially acceptable body size, so I just like to check my privilege first. The term privilege, which often makes no distinction at all between the good things one has earned in life, or that one's race or sex have earned, and the good things one is born into, depends on the assumption that unless one can claim some form of victimhood, one cannot really be said to have fairly earned anything. 
This aspect of blame and delegitimization is explicit in Peggy McIntosh's text, in which she speaks of whiteness and maleness as conferring, quote, unearned assets, end quote, by which the recipients find that, quote, many doors open through no virtues of their own, end quote. Privilege proves, in Macintosh's words, quote, the myth of meritocracy, end quote. I've noticed that some SJWs deny the implicit slur in the idea of privilege that men and whites have been given everything for free. The compiler of the male privilege list that my astronomer friend had to adopt actually states that, quote, being privileged does not mean men are given everything in life for free. Being privileged does not mean that men do not work hard, do not suffer, she claims, end quote. In practice, though, the term privilege does translate to pretty much exactly that men are given everything free and can't really own anything of their own. Some of you may have seen a few months ago Kate Brooks' performance in the 2015 Oxford Union debate on freedom of speech and the right to offend, in which Brooks accuses Peter Hitchens and Brendan O'Neill, her debating opponents, of being privileged white men. I really recommend watching that video clip if you can bear Brooks' voice and asinine argument. In one of her very first statements, Brooks claims that those concerned about offensive, hateful speech, the good SJWs, do not want to silence white men like Hitchens and O'Neill, but to, quote, erode, and this is her voice, erode the platform that our racist and misogynistic society has given to two privileged white men. Note her words. This platform is given by society to privileged white men, such as Hitchens. In other words, they earned nothing through their own talents and hard work. Standard social justice lingo, a smug and dishonest devaluation of the skills and dedication of men everywhere. Conversely, emphasis on privilege also suggests that there's something morally admirable in being a victim or an outsider. That lack of privilege brings with it special insights and a totally justifiable rage. That victims have the right, even perhaps the obligation, to express. Leveling charges of privilege becomes a game of moral one-upmanship in which whoever can accuse the other of the more reprehensible privilege has earned the right to belittle that person and to vaunt their own purity. And the claim of invisibility for privilege provides the perfect shield from logical rebuttal. If you deny that you've experienced privilege, that merely confirms that, see, we told you so, privilege is invisible. No matter how many concrete legal and societal barriers, disabilities, and acts of discrimination might be cataloged, quantified, and analyzed, the SJW will continue to claim that a widespread, unacknowledged, intangible, and even conveniently unprovable privilege still justifies and even mandates more SJW activism. I suggested earlier that the terms gender as a social construct and women's lived experience should both be logically attacked. The first through exposing the scientific untenability of feminist claims about gender. The second through uh, rationally dismantling the idea that women's experience deserves any kind of sanctifying status as a more reliable source of knowledge than men's. But what can be done about the term privilege? I don't think it can be attacked through reason. It is specially designed, as I've shown, to be impervious to reason. This is perhaps the special genius of much of third wave feminism, that it doesn't rest on verifiable claims, but on assertions about the world that simply through reiteration establish a powerful felt reality. Doesn't matter if the claims aren't true, they feel right. 
how to engage with them then? Well, stay tuned for the final two terms in my series and for my reflections on combating them.